So what are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? Trying to get on the Slice Dial Radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's all right. Oh. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. The opinions expressed during this show are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their associated organizations or Lifestyle Radio. Legacy 420 has medicinal and recreational products down to a science, literally. With two biochemists on staff and a chief scientific advisor, every product is tested in the Legacy 420 laboratory. Legacy 420, Ty and Danega. Open 9 to 9 every day. Visit Legacy420.com. So what are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? Trying to get on the Lifestyle Radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's all right. Oh. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. The opinions expressed during this show are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their associated organizations or Lifestyle Radio. Morning and welcome to Cannabis and Coffee with me, Tamara Wana. It's a beautiful day in the East Kootenays. A little chilly. It's I think minus twenty something, but I think it's cold across the country everywhere. We're getting snow and blowing. Spring just doesn't take on to the ass of twenty six days. My ass is what I keep thinking. Oh, but what can you do, right? Especially when you're a patient and you've got like you know arthritis. The weather really seems to affect a lot of us, and you know that's I think one thing when it's really cold. We're all aching and paining and, you know, cranky and, you know, but uh, that's what being a patient is and why we look for alternative medicine like cannabis. This morning I have a guest with me that's also, you know, looking for different alternatives for medication and has for years. She's a patient advocate out of Ottawa. Her name is Susie Strand. Good morning, Susie. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you doing besides being cold? Just trying to stay warm, just like everybody else, (laughs) I think, right? So usually I ask the who, what, where, whens, and why. So I'm going to ask you who you are and why you got involved in cannabis. Okay. Well, um, Susie Strand. Um, I got involved with cannabis because I have um, secondary progressive MS and trigeminal neuralgia. And when I was using all the pharmaceuticals that were given to me at the time, it was uh, like 82 pills a day plus injections. And I was in a wheelchair and I had young kids and I got frustrated feeling like I couldn't be part of the daily activities that were spending time with my babies. And I felt like nobody in a white coat was listening to me. And so I just kind of, we call it unplugged myself from the medical matrix, threw my hands up, said I've had enough of this. I've always enjoyed cannabis. Um, Even as a teenager, you know, you don't realize it's stress relief. It's just fun. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying the side effects of your medicine, like being a little funky high. (laughs) So when I, you know, but when I switched um, to cannabis only as my main source of treatment, um, I no longer need a wheelchair. I haven't needed it in so long. Actually, the batteries don't even work anymore. Um, Yeah, but I walk on my own, um, have a walker for bad days. You know, not every day is fantastic. But it, I felt like it gave me more control, not only over my body, but over my life. I mean, you're just sitting there watching life pass you by. It's easy to want to not do anything because you don't feel like you can. Absolutely. And that's the thing we find, too, is looking for quality of life, looking for things that make us have functionability with our children. Oh, well, that's it, exactly that. My son actually just got legal as well. He also suffers from trigeminal neuralgia. And I knew that route, for example, you know, we'd have to try some pharmaceuticals before anybody would even have a conversation with me about it. Right. And the pharmaceuticals weren't helping him either, were they? No, they weren't at all. And then we just had, you know, the whole other problem of the side effects you get from those and then the pills you take for those and then the one they add to your regime to deal with that side effect. And it snowballs. 
And right. some of these side effects are, are really serious. And for me, I, my argument to the doctor was you can't have an argument with me about cannabis in the developing teenage brain and then shove, you know, 1,800 milligrams of Lyrica at my kid. Right. That was a no-brainer for me. Right. And that's the thing, like, Lyrica is a nerve, you know, endings, what are they, it stops the, the pain. So it's like a nerve. It stops the neurological pain or whatever it's supposed to do, right? And in mm-hmm. reality, it just numbs you of everything. Like, I know Alvin has tried it before. I've never tried it. Once I seen what it did to him, it was like, mm, I think I'll stay away from that stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a numbing agent almost, right? Yeah, I tried it too before I'd unplugged, as we said it. And you, it doesn't only numb pain, but it kind of it numbs you emotionally too. Like, you just don't care about anything. Right. Yeah, that's what Which I mean. Which at like 14, you know, you're supposed to care. You're supposed to be chasing girls and football games and living life. You know, you're not an adult yet. Enjoy that for a hot second longer. And that's the hardest thing, too, is having, you know, these um, afflictions when you're when you're a teenager, right? Mm-hmm. And, I mean, a lot of us don't really, you know, realize how hard it is on the children that, you know, with the new cannabis regime, too, that they've left the kids that might possibly need it out. Oh, absolutely. That was an insane process, too. I had one specialist tell me he wouldn't consider signing him until I had three other specialist signatures telling me that the pills weren't working. Well, if, if you can't find one doctor to have an honest conversation with you, even as an adult about cannabis, um, how are you going to find three for a child? Right. Because he doesn't I'm suffer not- from... I find there's... I'm sorry, Tam, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but I find, especially for kids, there are some conditions that you just don't question when it comes to cannabis. Um, cancer, epilepsy, these seem to be the two big ones that nobody bats an eye about. But if you're talking about anxiety or chronic pain or things like this in children, cannabis is usually the last resort, I find, on any doctor's brain. And it's one that most parents have to push for. That's the way it is with most adults, too. It's always the last mm-hmm. resort instead of the first line of defense right oh, which and i think so sad right and i think that's what we've been advocating for so many years is you know like we're using it as a first line of defense preventative we've you know pushed that kind of um you know idea forward too is that if you're using it there really isn't any recreational use of cannabis like even if you're using it for um eating or sleeping or anything it's really not a recreational use. Like, I mean, sure, you you know, you get high and, you know, you laugh and you giggle and you eat something and you go to sleep. So I guess that's recreational. But in hindsight, after you've used cannabis for a, a period of time, you find that it's actually helping you in many ways that you didn't realize. Oh, well, that's it. Exactly. Like, I can't tell you really the last time I felt, you know, air quotes high, like, say, a beginner patient would. But I find when you really notice the benefits of cannabis is when you either lose your access to it or you don't have as much as you did. And then you start to notice the daily things that you kind of just take it for granted that don't hurt or tweak or didn't, you know, are moving functionally at the moment until you, you know, don't have your medicine. And then it kind of becomes blaringly obvious what cannabis does for you on the daily. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I know I've, I've heard from some patients that have only got access to the legal stores that are finding that what they're buying isn't helping them either. That they're going in and it doesn't really tell you on the labels what everything is. And, it, you know, until you get home, it's like 11% THC and 6% CBD. And in reality, we know that's not really helpful, right? So well, think you and I have been in, around cannabis long enough to actually know what those numbers mean. If you have a new patient who's trying to access medicine and no one is explaining this to them, you know, you get the wrong strain of cannabis, you have a reaction you don't like. Like, I personally can't go near Jack Herrer. It makes me anxious as can be, like panic attack to the max. I'm not a huge sativa fan because of it. But, like, you take somebody new to cannabis who doesn't really understand the difference in, say, sativa and indica, let alone CBD percentages and THC percentages and, and terpenes and the actual science behind it. You know, that's the part that's exciting now, I guess, the legalization is here, is the stigma is getting less, which, you know, we've been fighting so long for the stigma for medical patients, but now it's kind of like in Canada, you say cannabis and nobody really bats too much of an eye. But the science behind it needs to be explained to patients, I think, a lot better. And you can't get that from 
LPs necessarily the same as you could a dispensary, but they'll take the time to sit down and explain to you what this means and what this strain can do and right. things strain like that. Specific. Strain specific for a lot of people is a necessity. I'm the same. Absolutely. Person. A lot of sativa, especially if you if you do suffer from anxiety, um, depression, or anything like that, it, sativas can be really um, not good. Like they can throw mm-hmm. you into a panic attack, right? The paranoia from a sativa can be really crippling for some people, yes. right? And I hate to say you that, associate that with cannabis, unfortunately. Right, right. And it could be just that you've gotten the wrong strain. And then you don't like that effect, so you never try it again. You don't. And that's the thing. At least when you were able to go to a dispensary and buy like a gram or, you know, try different grams, you know, and it's not going to cost you um, a million dollars. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, exactly. Not that it's a million dollars. That's hugely exaggerated, but um, you know, but now you can't smell it. You, I guess there are some stores that do have uh, the new containers where you can actually see it and smell it, but that can be deceiving too in a lot of ways. Right. So Absolutely. you want to be able to buy a small amount of several different kinds and try them and, and see which is best for you. And then maybe get explained to you why, you know, this one might be particularly better. But unfortunately, yeah, that, I mean, that's being left to shoppers drug mart. That scares me. Right. Anytime you mix a pharmaceutical company with cannabis, I find it terrifying. And, you know, that even when they, they've tried these synthesized versions like Navalone and Sesamet and Sativex, it, it's just, if it's, it's not broken, stop trying to fix it. Right. It's like you not, just put a big flag over yourself. I am here for profit. That's it. Period. Well, I think that's the main, um, the worst part about it is that there's so many that have just kind of come into it for profit. And we want to see the science. So we want to see avocation done for people that actually need it. We were looking for, I think, better access for patients. Because in reality, that's what brought us here was patients. Patients need to access cannabis is what brought this whole regime of legalization to the head where it became legal. And now Absolutely. those patients don't have access to what they need because the restrictions have become so over-regulated, as that's how I see it, that there's no um, no room. And I seen this morning somewhere where um, CBD caps are no longer going to be sold in um, one of the stores because they're deemed medical instead of recreational. And I think I seen that at the, was it the Newfoundland or Nova Scotia um, this, uh, stores, like um, the BC, or not BC, uh, you know, the liquor control that they have going on out uh, down east where the, the stores are all controlled by the liquor boards. So mm-hmm. they're apparently taking the CBD caps off the shelves because they're deemed medical. So people that have now had access to those that now need them because they've now had access and they like them and they're helping them won't have access to those either. Right. So it just, I don't know, does it seem like it's gone a little backwardish to you? I don't know. To me, it no, it's like it's all flopped around, right? I agree completely. It's it's kind of like you feel like it's a bait and switch. I mean, if, if you're enjoying legalized cannabis, you should thank a medical patient first and foremost. But we shouldn't. We have we have never really been thought of in this process. I mean, since the announcement of the dissolution of the MMAR, patients have been royally screwed in Canada. Oh, absolutely. We had to fight to get our grow permits back. I've never recovered from that. Um, I mean, I was left without a doctor for two years. And when I did find a signing doctor, I went from a 35 gram a day prescription to two grams a day. Because that's all the system would allow, I've been told. I know, right? I I feel you because I'm in the, I think a lot of us are in the same boat where we had doctors that were willing to sign us for what we had prior um, mm-hmm. I went back to my doctor. She refused to sign a renewal because legalization was coming. I mean, right. I still got my grams per day, but I have to go through a licensed producer. I, I can't, I can't pay a doctor even three hundred dollars to get a grow permit. I just don't you have that kind have of time. Right? Exactly. Nobody should have to. And you know, I'm like, I, like, I, I feel yeah, because we've never really recovered since then because we moved. And if you hadn't moved, you're still under the MMAR. Because those mm-hmm. injunctions, that injunction is still in place. 
So if you held an MMA AR and didn't move or didn't change your prescription level or didn't want higher prescription, you're still covered under the MMAR. Right. Now, if you moved or you wanted your prescription changed or you changed doctors or your doctor refused or whatever little fucky thing that could come along in the last <laughs> three years, right, um, uh, is exactly, uh, you know, why why people have had to go to the, to the ACMPR. And the ACMPR mm-hmm. now has changed, too, because now they've curl, rolled it into the Cannabis Act. Right. So again, the paperwork has changed. So since 2011, since I've been signed, I've gone from MMAR to MMPR to ACMPR. There's been six different forms to have to fill out. One was 35 pages. The next one was 11 pages. The next one's three pages. Like, I'm confused. And the, but then, you know, the, the complication of the forms causes holdups from Health Canada and then people sit in limbo and in the meantime get arrested and 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 right I mean it was it was a good racket until legalization hit and I still think legalization is a great racket to be honest well I don't know where the patients are being left right now because even like you said with the racket because you can get Mm -hmm. a a license fairly easily for three grams now if you go through a licensed producer like you can go online and get one through Namaste MD or a lot of these, you know, free apps on your phone for absolutely mm-hmm. nothing, as long as you're going through the licensed producer. So when you hear the corpings of, oh, it's really easy to get a license or get a license now, it is if you want to go through a, a, a licensed producer, if you want to pay, you know, a licensed producer for your medicine, if you want to get a license to grow your own more than four plants, it ain't so easy. And and no. people seem to be quirping about that, especially down in your area of the woods, where it's so easy to get this stuff. And in reality, it's really not. It. I agree. I agree. And even if you go through an LP, not everybody wants to grow their, can- their own cannabis, and that's okay, too. But you have other options there as well, like the DG option, where you can have a designated grower and someone to grow your medicine for you. But I understand some people don't want the hassle whatsoever. But for a lot of medical patients affordability then comes into play. And even with some small modicum of discount at the checkout, it's still not affordable to fill most prescriptions for most folks. Absolutely. And so you buy what you can and try to make it stretch as long as you can, and that's not really as helpful as it should be. Well, no, it's like asking a diabetic to cut their insulin back by half. Exactly. You know, getting Just your don't prescription. be in too much pain that day, you know. <laughs> right. Well, even with the prescription cutting back. Like with the government putting, a, you know, oh, we'll allow up to three to five grams per day maximum. Well, what about the people that require 10 or 20? Oh, okay. Well, exactly. you're just, you, you just, like my husband said, if they cut him back to five, what are they saying? That he's 50% better? That his knee all of a sudden 50% of the cartilage grew back and now he can use it 50% better than he did before? Which is not the case, right? Like it's like saying my colitis is now ninety percent better because I only need you know five grams of medicine. Like it, yeah. it's ridiculous. Some of the things that they want to, you know, base it on. You know what I'm saying? So the government should not be involved in a prescription, in my opinion. Like I, I think what my doctor and I decide is going to work best for me should be between my doctor and I without my doctor having fear of losing his license because I require more cannabis than Joe blow up the street. Right. Well, you know, it's unfortunate that the laws in Canada around cannabis forced patients into the justice system. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's where we got, where we got into the justice system is because people were busted. People were, you know, caught growing their own medication. They were caught possessing their own medication People with MS, people with cancer, people with, you know, debilitating diseases. And that's where it led them because we had yeah. no other choice. So in, in hindsight, Canada should have never become part of the, the justice system. To begin with, right? That's where it's at. We, and then we have, you know, the justice, the, you know, Cannabis Act itself. We also have, you know, finance in there when it comes to, you know, public um, portfolios in Parliament. We have public safety in there. So they've opened the door for four different, you know, um, portfolios at the government level to be having their hands in cannabis. Oh, yeah. Like, how does that work? You see your doctor, the patient, 
And recreational should be, um, if it doesn't hurt you or harm you, then what's the problem? I think part of the big problem is prohibition did its job well. Like, I live um, across the street from a senior community, and I've, I've helped quite a few people who live there um, enter the world of medical cannabis. And they get excited, and they tell their friends, and then, you know, friends want clarification. And you do what you can. But, you know, the first thing I usually hear from them is I'm afraid of the side effects as they, you know, shake their bottle of Percocet at me. Right. And the side effects for pharmaceuticals are far worse than cannabis. Like I, like I mentioned to one of my patients, like she asked me dosing. I says, well, start with, you know, low and slow, but always remember to keep in the back of your mind. You can never, you might take too much and feel uncomfortable. Like there is a process mm-hmm. of taking too much and you might take too much so that you feel uncomfortable. You might feel that paranoid. You might feel like, you, you know, you need to sleep, which is fine, but you're never going to die from it. You well, take one too many exactly. pills, you ha- you take the risk. Like even with the crap that's been going on with me, I had to go to the doctor and I got you know some trauma stuff, which is a pain you know prescribed pain pill. Right on the mm-hmm. bottle it says addicting. Be careful because it can it can kill you because it can you can overdose by taking too many of them. Right. Right. And that's what I find. Like you know you have to maintain. Like okay, I only, I only take two of these. When did I take two of those? I can only take two more so many hours later because if I don't, I could overdose. If I take two too many, too many, you know, overlapping time-wise, right? With mm-hmm. cannabis, I can smoke a joint and then 10 minutes later smoke another joint and 10 minutes later smoke another joint. <laughs> and I know, you know what I mean? I know yeah. that I can smoke that amount of, you know, in a period of time. And I, I might fall asleep because I've smoked too much, <laughs> right? But I'm not going to die because I've, t- I've smoked too much cannabis, right? Well. Yeah, absolutely. But it also gives you in that moment some sense of control. And, you know, if you know for sure when you battle a chronic illness, for example, you don't have much control. But the one thing I can control is how crappy I'm going to feel because of my medicine. I feel horrible on pharmaceuticals. And I find that most doctors, because I'm very open and upfront about the fact that I'm a medical cannabis patient, won't entertain the idea of helping me with pain with pharmaceuticals because I'm a cannabis patient. See, and mine does a combo. Like, she understands that I, like, she knows I use cannabis. She prescribed it to me uh, before. Um, But when I go in there and say, it's not enough, she Mm -hmm. understands. Because, I mean, we have that kind of relationship because sometimes, I'm sorry to say it, sometimes it's not enough. Like, sometimes it's not taking the inflammation down where it needs to. So, anti-inflammatories are required, right? So, right. that's where I'm at with it. So, sometimes it is required. But, I mean, with her, she's, like, never shoved a bunch of pain pills down my throat. But she also knows the line I draw. Like, I won't take anything too heavy. You understand why? I'm using it with mm-hmm. cannabis, the combination of, right? So she makes sure right. that, the, uh, that whatever I am taking is something that's not going to be affected by the cannabis because I am very open with her too, right? So we work in combination with both. And I think that's where um, a lot of us are afraid to do that with their doctors. They're, and the doctors right. are afraid to mix the two because they don't know the effects because as patients, we have to be open with our, with our GPs. A lot of people hide their cannabis use from their GP, which gives the doctor not a lot of research to work with either. Like if you're hiding the fact that it's helping you from your GP, how are they supposed to learn? Oh, you still there? Yeah. 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 But like I said, like how, how are they supposed to, how are they supposed to learn anything if people are hiding their cannabis use from their well, doctor? Well, that's it. Exactly. But I think a lot of that goes back to the fear of the stigma. Absolutely. But now we're not there anymore. Now with it legal, we're, with the medical getting program, better. Right. Like I, I had a hard time discussing uh, medical cannabis with my son's family doctor, for example. But when, because we had to go through a clinic again because nobody would discuss this with me because he's fourteen. But in the clinic, you you didn't have that fear of what the doctor was going to think and say because they don't deal with anything else but cannabis. Right, and it should be like that with every doctor. You shouldn't have that fear of not being taken seriously or being labeled, you know, something that you're not just for trying to make yourself feel better. That's not a crime. Absolutely. Well, I know that there are doctors out there that do have accredited, there are accredited cannabinoid therapy courses that the doctors can take. I've been speaking with one in Alberta that used to be an anesthesiologist and he has now gone strictly to cannabinoid medication. They're still 
you know, they're still looking and he works at the University of Alberta Hospital um, in Edmonton, actually. So there is research being done. That was one thing that made me um, hopeful that, you know, maybe there is more research being looked at because he also works with a pediatric neurologist that's looking at cannabis for children. But of course, you're in the research stages, right? And, and looking at what they can and can't do and the, and the, and the dosing. That's one thing um, that he said to me is really difficult because of the fact that they don't know what the dosing, because there are so many strains, because there is no specific like strain of like, you know, with, with a pharmaceutical, there's a strain of what exactly is in it all the time. It's, the same, mm-hmm. it's always exactly the same. With cannabis, it's not, right? right? So the research is really difficult. But, for but at least to- you don't have the... But, I mean, I feel like doctors should at least take comfort in the fact that, you know, worrying about accidental overdose that would kill their patient is not on the table. You know what I mean? Like, we trial and error with pharmaceuticals all the time. I can't tell you how many pills have come through this house and searched for some relief for somebody who lives here. But none of us, you know, we medicate with cannabis. None of us have to worry about, you know, not waking up. Absolutely. That is true. And I think that's one thing that... Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about patients being able to talk to their doctors because I find that sometimes if you can interest a doctor in what you're talking about in cannabis, then not only will they research it, but they'll talk to their colleagues about it. And that's how the big conversations happen and minds get changed. Right. Absolutely. But it's finding that one doctor that's willing to talk. Right. And that's difficult because a lot of them, like, you know, you still hear it, even with you know, legalization, and even with the medical program, there's still a lot of old doctors that don't want to hear about it. Like, I've got patients that come to me that, you know, they go in and they talk to their doctor, and the doctor don't want to hear about it. I've had patients that have been You're dropped by their doctor. Bit, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there's some situations, that, like, I know, I don't know what the doctor situation is in, in Ontario, but in British Columbia, you it's hard to find a doctor in my area. Anyways, like, we have clinics that aren't taking new patients, we don't have walk-in clinics. We have the emergency room or, or four clinics in, in the whole town. And all those doctors are full. So right now we have a population in the city that can't even get a doctor, never mind find a cannabis-friendly doctor. You know what I'm saying? Right. So that's a situation, I think, with our health care system overall, that we're lacking services across the country for doctors, period, never mind cannabis therapy doctors. <laughs> like, You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But you know that how the government decided to shut us up about that was to allow nurse practitioners to prescribe. But good luck finding one of those in a rural community. Yeah, well, the nurse practitioners that we have here are not allowed to. That, really? like, that's the thing. Like like I said, I think it was the clinic that stigmatized, or that um, stagnated my doctor because she was willing to sign the first year for both my husband and I. And then the second year when we went for our renewals, she was like, no, I can't. Um, legalization's come and she had a great big long regime about it, but she knows I still use cannabis. She knows that I'm, I went to another doctor to get my signature. She is totally on board with the fact that I'm using cannabis, but there's something still within the Canadian Medical Association or with our college and physicians that is blocking them. And I'm not understanding or really sure whether they're standing behind the facade of research, they're standing behind the facade of the pharmaceutical company stagnating them. There is something there that we aren't seeing. You know what I'm saying? There's it's, something that's uh, stopping them. That is a definite barrier. You feel it. And it's, it's hard to understand. Because, again, we're talking about a plant, and maybe that's what it is. It, it, prohibition is just really hammered at home for a lot of people and getting them to be open to the research where the idea that cannabis is not dangerous is already the first hurdle. And if those well, are the, the guys in charge, then we're all kind of screwed. Well, I think you know, the fact that, you know, it's, it is a plant and it's natural medicine, right. And therapeutic medicine, and it doesn't come out of a Petri dish. And when you're dealing with scientists, a lot of them don't understand anything that doesn't come out of a Petri dish. You know what I'm saying? Like we have to break that whole stigmatization of the fact that it is a plant, but it's still organic and it still can be made in a Petri dish. It's just not meant to be made in a Petri dish, you know, like it's really difficult to, to, you know, decipher that. We're going to take a quick break here and then we'll come back and talk more to you about what you're doing with your son's uh, health as well, because that's really um, something that a lot of my listeners like to hear about is how 
kids are getting access and are getting help with the use of cannabis. And I think that's something that we all need to hear about. So we'll be right back with Susie. Uh, I'd like to thank my sponsors who are 12 High Chicks Magazine, Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partner Society, Mom Maritime United for Medical Marijuana, and the Haley Rose Foundation. Because I was at the Foreigner concert last night, we're going to hear Foreigner as cold as ice. We'll be right back with Susie Strand. Legacy 420 has medicinal and recreational products down to a science, literally. With two biochemists on staff and a chief scientific advisor, every product is tested in the Legacy 420 laboratory. Legacy 420, Ty and Denega. Open 9 to 9 every day. Visit Legacy420.com. Hey, this is Cheech. And this is Chong. And you're listening to Lifestyle Radio. What is it? Lifestyle Radio. Say it one more time. 420 Radio? Ooh. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. with Susie. We've been having a good conversation about, you know, the plant and how it's helping so many people and the fact that, you know, we, we have children out there that use cannabis, whether um, people like to hear it or not, and, and how beneficial it is to many children out there. Because let's face it, shoving them full of pharmaceuticals isn't beneficial. It hurts our kidneys. Can you imagine they're worried about their brains with cannabis? What about their kidneys and their livers and their brains with pharmaceuticals? So, Susie, you you finally found a doctor that was willing to help you with your 14-year-old. 
How did that was I a did. struggle? It was, a, it was it was a huge struggle. That was probably almost as hard as watching him suffer. I went to his family doctor. That was a no. I went to his specialist neurologist who was out of Chio, and she looked at me like I'd grown a third eyeball. Um, I even tried a walk-in clinic. Um, I had luck. My very first signing doctor was actually from an apple tree walk-in clinic. I love that guy. Um, and I, you know, we all know of a few clinics where you can pay to see the doctor, and they're, let's be honest, a little less discerning sometimes about who they'll help without giving you grief about it. And that was a no. And then I came across um, a doctor out of Belleville, Dr. Appleton. And um, he's the one who told me that he wouldn't sign until I could find three other specialists, but I should try the Apollo Clinic. And they have um, pediatric doctors and uh, signing nursing practitioners who specialize in pediatrics. Um, who were not only willing to have a conversation with me, but it just, it was amazing to me how easy it was to talk about cannabis in my kid. And that's phenomenal because there's so many parents out there that even with legalization would still be put into prosecution if they were caught giving their children cannabis. Well, it's a legitimate fear and it, it shouldn't be like you've, you put a lot of parents in position if they can't find a signing doctor that if, especially if they suffer from the same conditions, like the condition that my, my son has is trigeminal neuralgia and it's pretty rare. And it's known as one of the most painful diseases to people can have. And so the pills aren't working and I'm watching my kids suffer and having the same symptoms, knowing exactly what that feels like and knowing what cannabis did for me. You know, the first thing I wanted to do was to, pop some oil in his face but even I as open to, to cannabis as I am had that fear I know I don't want to go to prison for trying to help my kid feel better no parent does well then you're not there for your kid if you're exactly. in prison exactly exactly you can't be if you're in prison I was really fortunate I know a lot of parents don't have not had the fortune I have about finding a signing doctor and I was able it went really quick for us and we were very, very lucky. I didn't have to, you know, kind of sit on my hands too long. Well, I mean, for the, for the length of time that you did have, like, you know what I mean? Like reaching out to how many people did you have to reach out to to finally find this doctor? Like, you know, like, I mean, it, it wasn't yeah. just like I walked down the street and I'm going to go find this doctor. It still took months. And like, and that's where oh, we're did. at. Like, you it know, it, it's still struggling. Like, even like for, for people that are sick, a day's too long sometimes. You know what I mean? When you're suffering in pain, uh, having to wait a month to see a doctor is like a year. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think people that don't live in chronic with chronic pain or disabilities understand what it feels like. You know, when you're in pain, an hour feels like forever. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, it, it does. And especially pain conditions. I know you understand this, but they also have psychological effects on people. When you're in constant pain, it causes depression. And then you have to wait. Somebody tells you, you have to wait to see the doctor to try to find some relief. That for some people is too much to bear. Never mind the fact that you go to a doctor, they won't listen to you and you're still not getting any relief anyways. So the, the depression even like, you know, gets deeper because you're home. You're taking pills that aren't helping anyways. You know who it's going to help you, but you can't get a signature because the doctor won't listen to you. So where does that leave people? That leaves well, people in the, despair. The doctors will tell you now that leaves people with legalization. Right. I guess. Which, I guess that does help some people. Well, I mean, you have to look at the other side of this too now. Yes, we have legalization, but we're still talking about access. Like some people are not going to, so I know people who don't use computers. So if my only way to access legal cannabis is from the online store here in Ontario currently, what am I going to do? Right. In an effort to feel better. I mean, if, if the object was to curb the black market, that's really funny. Well, it's even here. Like we have two stores, but they're in Kimberly. Cranbrook doesn't mm -hmm. have them. We've got, we've got six cited to be set up. But we haven't got six set up yet. We've got none set up yet. It's been since October the 17th. We're going into March and still yeah. not a store up in Cranbrook. And like I said, Kimberly, for people that have 
no vehicle. We have no transit. How mm-hmm. are they supposed to get there? That's the same for, for me. Like there's supposed to be two stores open in Ottawa, but I live in the middle of nowhere. It takes me an hour to drive to Ottawa. And because I've been having seizures lately, my doctor took my license. So if I was yeah. not lucky and had a signing doctor and was dependent on legalization, um, go without or buy off the street, right? Well, absolutely. I think people are finding that the quality on the street is still better than it is in the store. And you that's know how much LP pot you can find on the street? I'm sorry. That is funny to me. Oh, I don't know. I would imagine a fair bit. See, like um, I said, we don't have that access. Like, I mean, in, in British Columbia, we've always had craft. I mean, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, it's not hard to find <laughs> anything out here. Like, I'm just saying, like, you know, even in the East Kootenai, like, it's Seems like a lot of times our pot flies over top and heads into Alberta, but we still have a, a fairly, you know, vibrant market here. Um, Nelson's only an hour and a half west of us, so we already know what the market is in Nelson. It's exuberant all through the salmon, salmon arm and, and, and Salmo and all through that area. That's been craft growing for three decades. So it's not like cannabis is not accessible anywhere in this country with the seed sales and everything else that we've had over the last you know, two decades, mm-hmm. thankfully, because that has given people the ability to learn to grow their own, to grow better cannabis, to grow quality cannabis. So the stuff that people are getting out of the licensed producer, like I always said, it's going to be quality over quantity. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. But that's, that's what's so fun, I think, sorry, about this point of where we are in cannabis is so many more people, even if they are just still in the legalization area, are more open to learning different ways to use their cannabis even. So you've got people who were strictly joint smokers who are now asking, how do I make medibles? How do I make oil? Like, how do I do this safely? How do I do this? Absolutely. So they're starting to realize they're, you know. Well, the education, like I said, the dispensaries, yeah, the education. Like I said, the, the dispensaries that we had prior to really opened the doors for people for, for educating for med- medical, right? Um, we've right. got small companies that have been doing this for, like I said, two decades that have given everybody an option. Let's face it, the mail order options that we've had out there have given people the options. Now these stores are open, everybody's laughing about it because it's like, well, we could still get the stuff online. We can still get you know stuff that we need online. It's the waiting and we shouldn't have to. I think that's the whole point, that we shouldn't have to order online. These things should have, it should have been, an, I'm not saying an open, but we, they should have allowed the existing businesses that were already running to have an opportunity to be first out of the gate. That's all never I'm saying. Happened. It would never and happen. And they should have done it that way, because that way, the access, the market, I mean, it would be so much better for everybody now, even as, as we sit. Because the regulations would be the same as they are. Let's face it. They can leave the regulations as tightly as they are. But they need to let the smaller people in and not be so worried about, I don't know, somebody making a little bit of extra money other than them. You know what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. They completely, I don't think Canadians could say any louder to their government, we want cannabis. And I think the government just completely underestimated how true that is like right out of the gate you know everything is sold out like we cannot scream to you any louder and these are just people who could afford to drop like 330 350 on an ounce not everybody can do that either (laughs) well no and the fact that excuse me the matter was you know to get into the market as a legalized (laughs) licensed producer of crafting you need millions of dollars and that i think for patients is not attainable. Like anybody no. who's living on disability or trying to struggle to get access period, those, those numbers were never attainable for people that were on, uh, that are medical patients. I mean, you know, it makes you wonder if they were ever really supposed to be, we've always kind of been a fly in their ointment. If you think about it, we refuse to accept no to access. Um, we sued the government literally um, we are not going away. We have no plans to go away, and we're just kind of going to keep beating your face until you hear us. That's kind of where we are now, isn't it, though? Well, and I think we're going back to court, too, from the murmurings I'm hearing, is because of the fact that the medical patients have been thrown under the bus and not been included in the, in the legal regime, because our edibles are being capped at such a low rate, um, 
we're going back to court to allow for medical dispensaries to be run as far as I'm um, murmuring. Like I said, I haven't um, seen any paperwork go into the courts yet for charter challenges, but I know there's charter challenges in Nova Scotia coming up here right away. Um, there's mm-hmm. charter challenges all across the country um, because of the fact that the medical patients, and, and they're still raiding medical dispensaries because there are people that are still willing out there to stand up and say, no, this is not right. And we're staying open and we're not going to close our doors. And they're being raided, unfortunately, but they're still standing up. And I, I appreciate you people that are doing that. I really do. I do too. I was just going to say so much respect and love to dispensary owners. It's, it's scary times to, to be the one to say enough is enough and people matter. And, and really appreciate well, that people are still doing it. I would much rather well, have education from somebody who deals with cannabis than a pharmacist at Shoppers. What do you know about medicine like that? Right. And, and, and the cannabinoid, you know, whatever they're reading or whatever education they're getting, how factual is it? And well, Yeah. It's government propaganda is what it is. Well, I mean, I know a lot of research is being being done in other countries. I'm not saying that some of the, you know, education and research that's being done isn't on par. But, you know, they still got that stigma of harm. And I mm-hmm. really, you know, really have a hard time with them throwing out there the risks and harms. And even when you buy it in the legal market, they've got the warning labels on it. And the only warning that I've got for anybody is you might feel a bit paranoid. You might eat too much and you're definitely going to fall asleep. <laughs> like, yeah, unless you get sativa, I mean? in which case your house will be clean. Right. Right. Exactly. Because sativa is real, you know, different, for, you know, different for everybody. Because sativa is for me, some of them don't do that to me. Some of them slow me right down. It's like an opposite effect. I don't know. Like, like I said, it's yeah. so strain specific. It just mm-hmm. depends. So you guys kind of back to what we were talking about earlier about how if you have one bad experience with a strain of cannabis, you just kind of throw your hands up. That's me and Sativa's period. I kind of just don't go near them after that. I did for a long time too. I did for a long time too. Now I'm finding that if I experiment a little bit, some of them still do the exact same thing. Like I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes I just, there's no absolutely way. But I found a couple of them that are specific for anxiety um, that are Sativa's that are specific for anxiety, like a blue skunk. Um, actually mm-hmm. do slow me slow me down a little bit and actually make it so that I do want to clean rather than just squirreling right out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's oh, the best way like to describe the, the it. Squirrel. Just, <laughs> yeah, like Andrew, you understand what I'm talking about. Oh, but I think it's absolutely. people with attention attention deficit find that um sativas aren't so great for. And you're right. One bad experience will turn everybody against anything. It doesn't matter whether it's alcohol um, any substance you have one bad experience, it's likely going to turn turn you again, like you know, not wanting to do it again, and and that's fine. Like I said, cannabis isn't for everybody either, and I'm not one to push cannabis on anybody. It, it's it's what I use for medication. I know a lot of people that do use it for medication. I know a lot of people that like it for recreation, but it's not something I'm going to shove down your throat. You know what I'm saying? Like no. If you like to, you know, like it's personal choice, and I think that's the best part about living in Canada is that we do have personal freedoms. I mean, as much as we, you know, say we don't, and, you know, there's so many different things and different aspects, but we all have a right to speak them. You know what I mean? We all have a right to say what we feel, and we all have a right to protest against it. So living in Canada gives us a, at least that opportunity. And, I mean, we are the only country in the world that has legal cannabis. So, you know, that's not so bad, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> not even at if, all. Even if it's not the way we wanted to see it done, I mean, it's still... You know what I'm saying? Like, we still have yeah. this. People are going to jail immediately now. They get ticketed. In fact, I haven't really heard too many people getting tickets either. Like, to be honest with you. Like, it's not um, on the news regularly that people are being ticketed for cannabis. Yeah, I just read an article this morning in my little local newspaper that said um, there's been no increase in uh, driving uh, tickets issued in our area since legalization. And I think that's. Yeah. The government kind of like expected to catch everybody riding in token, and yeah, I think they figured we were all right, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're, they're, they we're like, right, this is what they do, isn't it? They just they drive around and get high and and cause accidents, isn't that how that works? 
Yeah, right. I, 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 yeah. That you mentioned that because we had that um, same kind of thing. We have a, our CMP out here that put a monthly, you know, how many calls they've had come in. And usually it was drug seizures and it was always like, you know, a little bit of marijuana. Now the drug seizures are meth, fentanyl. fentanyl There's no yeah. cannabis you know, no cannabis at all, which I'm, I'm pleased to see because I'd rather see them going after the mass and the fentanyl than the cannabis. Right. And, you know, there's been no increase of driving well high on cannabis here either. So I guess kudos to all the potheads, <laughs> proving, <laughs> right? proving that, you know, proving that they're not getting us right. That they're not catching us doing anything wrong because newsflash, we weren't doing anything wrong to begin with. Right. Like that. I think that's, yeah. you know, one thing, the only thing that I, I said one time before was the only thing that was illegal about cannabis was the laws against it. It's just ridiculous. It's true. That's so where do you see, true. where, where, where do your plans? Are you, are you, um, 420 in Ottawa this year? Are you going to be involved with that or what, what do you got going on in the near future? I, um, uh, I really don't hit Ottawa too much anymore. I kind of stay in my little corner of Finch and medicate out here and, um, it just, if I, I can direct people sometimes to where they can find prescriptions. So I'm, I'm enjoying that role, I guess, and feeling helpful because I, I think, especially if you're a long time cannabis user medicinally and you know what it does for you, you go through these phases where you just, you want everybody in earshot of you to understand. You, you just can't stop talking about the differences made in your life. And, you know, right. I find now that I'm watching my teenager go from you know, describing to me how he doesn't feel like himself and he, he doesn't feel well and he's having a hard time adjusting to trying to still want to be social and being in pain to, you know, we'll give him his medicine and then he can go to school and he comes home and he's like, mom, I've had a great day. I was laughing with my friends. I was able to do gym today. So I'm at a point now where I feel like I've, I've shouted it from the mountaintops about myself for many years. And now because I've been able to be an advocate for my child and I've seen the difference it's made in the quality of his life. I mean, it's, being a teenager is hard enough. But being a teenager and just feeling like crap all the time is the double dose. of. But just to see the difference in him, I'm at that point. I just I want everybody to listen that, you know, cannabis for your child is not taboo. It is not the enemy. It should not require the eyebrow up from your doctor. It's a real conversation that is okay to have. You should have. If you have a child that's suffering, you should research yourself about medicinal cannabis. And if you can't find the research, Granny Stormcrow has got the best list I've ever seen that's researchable by condition. Absolutely. And that's one thing the message we have to get out is that it's okay to talk about it. And we don't have to be in the cities. Wherever you are, if you're cannabis, whether you're living in a population of 30 people and you know the benefits of cannabis, talking to your neighbors is the best way you can actually do avocation. And that's thank you for being changed. out there. Yeah, and that's how minds get changed. And so thank you for being out there and doing what you do and have been well, for so many years. You do. Yeah. you do a lot for the community. You do. I mean, you're, you're quite modest about it, but I know there's a lot of people who would not be okay if they didn't know you. Oh, come on. <laughs> I That's think that, you know, it's just passing off. Like, you know, when it started, it was, it was paying it forward. Right. And mm -hmm. when I was given the gift of getting my license, when I was, you know, sent to Ottawa, it was other patients that made sure that I got to Ottawa. It was other patients that made sure I got to see the doctor. It was other patients that educated me on how to educate everybody else. And if it wasn't for other patients like Michelle Rainey and Vicki Fleming, actually, there's so many people out there. Um, but Vicki's the one that took me to see Dr. Cameron. Um, the unsung heroes that we don't even talk about anymore, you know, that are still out there doing for patients that aren't asking for notoriety. Right. Yeah. So and I think those are the ones that really need to get a little bit of attention and just say thank you. Like it's we not a matter shadow of angels. <laughs> right. Exactly. And just to be able to say thank you. Thank you for taking me to see the doctor. Thank you for showing me how to make RSO. Thank you for showing me how to put that seed in the ground. Thank you to Robin and Al Barasa, who are no longer with us, that gave me my first seeds. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just all back to paying it forward. And I think our community has been lost in this legalization. It breaks my heart to see that so many have 
crossed over to the other side, I guess, if you want to put it that way, that of, you know, trying to make, you know, forward an illegal regime, which is fine. I mean, we're all entitled to do what we feel we have to do for our families. But to those out there that are still plugging away, uh, doing what they do, and I know that, you know, some of you are out there listening, um, just keep doing what you're doing. Making sure people are okay. Oh, the bottom of this little girl's heart, I thank you. Exactly. Like just making sure that, you know, old grandma down the block that can't get her edibles anymore is still getting them. <laughs> you yeah, know what I'm saying? Exactly. Because that helps. Like, and I tell people too, like, education's not illegal. If you're bringing somebody to your home and they're bringing their cannabis with them and they're bringing their oil or, or their isopropanol and whatever you're using and you're teaching them how to make it in your home or you're going to their home and teaching them, that's not illegal, folks. So if you can go and educate people by helping them in their homes, teaching them how to make cookies, make can of butter, make oil, make whatever, do it. Do it as often mm-hmm. and as careful, you know, be careful while you're doing it, of course, and as carefully as you can, but go do it. Like, I mean, education is something that we all can give and it's free. Well, that is probably one of the most important things you can give someone is the ability to help themselves. Absolutely. And I think that's where we're at. Like, you know, I, I would rather, I don't know, like I said, I guess it's just a matter of passing it and paying it forward. And I think if we all just kind of keep that in mind when we're, you know, like you said, helping each other. And that's how we all got started was patients helping patients. And there's still Absolutely. so many of us out there that are patients just helping patients and patients over profit because that's something I think many people have forgotten as well. So you got anybody you want to shout out to, lady? We're just about ready to wrap up the show. So well, do you want to say hello or say, say anything to anybody? I give a shout out to my kid, who is my absolute hero, Alex. Mama loves you. Shout out to my boyfriend because he thinks I'm cool in this moment. So, hey, John, <laughs> bring me home with the Timmy's. <laughs> <laughs> and well, to everybody, up. seriously, though, everybody who's, who's in, the, in the wings helping folks, you're doing great work. Um, and those of you who don't need to be in the paper about it, you know, we still see you. Thank you. Those are my shout outs. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's the thing is that we still see you, right? And, yes. and that's, you know, a, a big thank you because there's so many people in the wings that we don't see every day that are doing stuff. And the, the, the ones that are out there still doing, like the dispensary owners that are still standing behind the counters, still risking their, risking their freedom every day to the ones that are in court. Because we know the ones out in Nova Scotia that Heidi and, and Alex and everybody that's out in Nova Scotia. Kudos to you for and actually those, standing up, yeah. right? And those who go because, support them, too. Thanks for that. We can't all be there. Right. Absolutely. The court support people. Chris Backer, you know, and, and Deb Stoltz. Amazing. Them. They're amazing, right? Like the mom crew. Those guys are totally amazing out there in Nova oh. Scotia. They're out, you know, traveling hours, four hours sometimes to get to a court case for some of I them. know. The mom crew makes me so jealous about the lack of community where I am as far as cannabis goes. I mean, I've told Debbie that all the time, but yeah, it's true. The mom crew makes me so jealous. They have potlucks. They have get-togethers. They are there for each other. That is a that's, solid group of patients. That's right. And they, they do. They have bazaars. They just finished with their with their uh, bazaar, uh, um, Valentine's Day bazaar, which was really successful too. And they got Harvest Fest coming up again this year. Because Debbie's oh, going stuff. over there. Yeah, they're going ahead with Harvest Fest. So if you guys are looking towards uh, the, the summer, Harvest Fest is a go this year, apparently. I'm trying to get Kootenai Cannabis Cup together, too. Um, it's, you know, anybody who wants to sponsor would be appreciated because it's, it's difficult for us to get sponsors this year because of the new regime with the advertising and the smaller businesses that are trying to stay within the legal, you know, regime to try and get into the legal market. It's, it's right. not easy to go. So, you know, again, I'd like to thank everybody that's, you know, still working towards legalization, getting themselves, you know, and keeping going because that's just, it's tough. It's tough out there. Your heroes. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I'd like to thank my sponsors who are 12 High Chicks Magazine. Maritimers United for Medical Marijuana, you guys are terrific out there. We love you. Uh, Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partners Society and the Haley Rose Foundation. Shout out to Cheryl. She's doing a heck of a great job with Haley right now. And big love to you guys because I know that uh, it's always a struggle for them too. And to my producer, Al Rapp, who always does a great job for helping me out with my show. And to you, my dear, for coming on. I appreciate it. Well, thanks so much for having me, Dan. I had a great time. Again, I love having my guests on. It's, you know, always education. Like, it, it just, 
to talk to people that are actually living it, right? And actually going so through actually, and having, you know, just the experience to pass it on to other patients. So thank you again for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, well, next week we will be talking to, I'm not even sure yet, I've got a couple people on the back burner here that I've got to get a hold of, so I'll come up with somebody for next week. (laughs) It's always hit and miss sometimes, right? So you all have a great week, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Legacy 420 has medicinal and recreational products down to a science, literally. With two biochemists on staff and a chief scientific advisor, every product is tested in the Legacy 420 laboratory. Legacy 420, Tyndanaga. Open 9 to 9 every day. Visit Legacy420.com. So what are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? Trying to get on the Slice Radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's all right. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. The opinions expressed during this show are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their associated organizations or Lifestyle Radio.